So for the Bernoulli equation, we've got a whole bunch of terms, but in many situations, we only need to do with a few, deal with a few of those terms. So I find it all, it's often useful to look at some specific situations where you have just a few things changing. So you can focus on just those few things. Like for instance, one, one special case is if you've got uh, just a tank of water or whatever fluid, doesn't have to be water. You've got some fluid that's not moving. And let's say you want to compare two points in a fluid that isn't moving. Let's say the point at the top and the point at the bottom. If you wanted to compare those two points, what are the only terms of the Bernoulli equation that we actually need? What could be changing from one to two? Pressure. Yeah, we definitely have change in pressure. And yeah, we could have change in height as well because they're definitely at different heights. So we've got our change in pressure term. We've got our kinetic energy, or sorry, potential energy term, rho g delta y. Is there any change in speed? No. No, the fluid's not even moving. So that means this speed is zero, this speed is zero, zero squared minus zero squared is zero. So if the fluid's not moving, you can always ignore the kinetic energy term. There's no pump, so we can ignore that. And even though the tank might have resistance, there's no current, so we can ignore the IR term. So we just have delta pressure plus rho g delta y equals zero. So this is the simplified Bernoulli equation we get for any situation where the fluid is not moving and there's no pump. So this is uh, usually called hydrostatic. Hydro meaning water, but more generally any fluid, and static meaning not moving. So the hydrostatic Bernoulli equation is the simplified version we get if the fluid is not moving. And if you saw that for delta pressure, we're just gonna get Delta pressure equals negative rho g delta y. In other words, the difference in pressure between these two points is going to be proportional to the difference in height. The more different the heights are, the more different the pressures are. And if you're comparing two, height, two points at the same height, let's say point 0.3 and point 0.4, what can you say about those two points? Their pressure is the same. Right. In a hydrostatic system, if the heights are the same, there's no delta y. Therefore, the pressures are the same. There's no delta pressure. That's not true more generally. We can't really say that's true if the fluid is moving, because there may be other terms that throw that off. But if the fluid is not moving, then same height means no difference in pressure either, because the difference in pressure is proportional to the difference in height. And then the constant of proportionality involves the density of the fluid and the strength of gravity. And of course, this negative just means that these deltas are in the opposite direction. As you go up in height, you lose pressure. As you go down in height, you gain pressure. Any questions on that hydrostatic case? So let's take a look at uh, what happens if the fluid is moving. Uh, if the fluid is moving, if you do have speed, what's the only circumstance where you would actually consider a change in speed? What's the only time that you'd expect speed to be changing from point to point? Would that be if you have a pump? A uh, pump doesn't directly cause a change in speed. The pump would allow this term to be there, but that doesn't cause the speeds to be different. But yeah, the area changing is the important thing. If you've got a pipe, let's say a strangely shaped pipe with a changing cross-sectional area, and you're comparing two locations in that pipe, let's say point one and point two. Actually, let me redraw that so that we have no change in height, so we don't have to worry about other things changing as well. Let's say we've got a pipe that's a constant height on average, we're literally looking at the height of the center. So the height of the center is not changing, but with definitely a change in area. And let's say we want to compare this point and this point. And let's assume that fluid is flowing here. 
So we've got fluid flowing, let's say from left to right. And we want to write out a Bernoulli equation comparing one to two. Uh, generally, I would recommend including delta pressure no matter what, unless you know for sure that the two points are at the same pressure. Like for instance, if both points are exposed to open air, then they both have to be at atmospheric pressure. So in that case, you would ignore delta P. But the only, in, in, unless you know for sure that they have to be at the same pressure, I would include delta P because pressure is often what changes to make up for other changes. So I would include delta P in general, unless you know for sure that the two points are forced to be at the same pressure. Uh, is there any difference in height between points one and two? So we can ignore that. They're both at the same elevation. There could be a difference in speed though, because they have different cross-sectional areas. And there's no pump. And let's assume for the moment that the resistance is negligible. We have, let's say, a very smooth pipe. So we just have equals zero on the other side. But the reason why the speed has to change involves the idea of what we call continuity principle. What do we know is not changing from point one to point two? What has to be the same at any two points in the pipe? The flow rate, right. In other words, the current. The current is the same everywhere in the pipe. Current one equals current two equals current anywhere else in the pipe. And the reason for this has to do with how current is defined. Current is a flow rate, a rate of change. Specifically, change in what over change in what? What exactly is current measuring? How would you describe how much fluid has flowed? Yeah, amount of liquid. And specifically, we describe that as a volume. So change in volume of liquid divided by change in time. And I think perhaps the most convenient way to visualize this would be if you imagine one end of the pipe is opened up and you hold a bucket out, the bucket gradually fills up with water or whatever the fluid is. The current is how much volume is spilling into that bucket per second. It's the, and this is often called the volumetric flow rate because we describe it in terms of how much volume per second. So that's what current means. This is the definition of current. But it's not always the most convenient way to convenient formula to use. It's very useful for thinking about things like why the current has to be the same everywhere. If you've got, for instance, five liters of water flowing in in one second, you also have to have five liters of water flowing out in one second. You can't have more fluid flowing in than flowing out or vice versa. The only time that is possible is if the fluid can be compressed. Like let's say you've got six gallons per second flowing in, but only four gallons per second flowing out. If you've got more flowing in than flowing out, then the fluid is getting more bunched up in the inside. You're getting its accumulation. And that's possible for some fluids, but it can't last forever. You can't have the fluid continue to get more and more and more compressed. That's gonna hit some sort of limit at some point. So it's not a steady state system. In a steady state system, we should assume that the current is the same everywhere in that path. But that's only of course, if we have just one path. Another modification to that can be if you have a splitting path. Like let's say you've got a pipe that splits into several pieces. So you could have, let's say, current one, current two, and current three. In that case, we wouldn't say these currents are all the same, but what could we say about how they're related to each other? If you've got a certain amount of fluid flowing in, like let's say you've got every second five gallons flow in. Yeah, the other currents have to add up to the current going in. Current in equals current out. 
So in this case, I1 equals I2 plus I3. We still have the basic idea that the current flowing in equals the current flowing out. It's just that the current flowing out is split up into two subcurrents. So more generally, we would say the total, the sum of current flowing in equals the total sum of all current flowing out. And you can treat that as a statement about a region. If you draw any region, no matter how weirdly shaped or squiggly, if you just draw some region, some border, the total amount of current going into that region has to match the total amount of current going out of that region. This is usually called the principle of continuity. Later on, when we get to uh, electrical current, we're going to see an almost a, an essentially identical idea called uh, the junction rule. So for fluid flow, it's usually called the continuity principle. For electrical flow, it's usually called the junction rule or sometimes Kirchhoff's current law. But it all means the same thing. Total current flowing in has to equal total current flowing out in a steady state system. <coughs> However, there's another formula we could use here. Current is defined as volume over time, but what else does current equal? What's another way of writing the formula for current? If you take a look at that cylinder of pipe, let's say we treat the pipe as a cylinder. and you've got fluid flowing through. Yeah, it should be velocity times area, right? And these are actually the same thing. The, the, they certainly look like different formulas. So current equals, current is defined as change in volume over change in time, but also happens to equal area times speed, small v for speed as opposed to Volume is usually capital V. I usually just write out vol or volume to avoid the confusion. But the reason these end up being the same, if you have a cylindrical shape, how would you write out geometrically, how would you write out the volume of that shape? How do you calculate volume of a cylinder like that? We presumably have some distance, right? Let's say we call this distance delta x. How would you turn that distance delta x into a volume? Yeah, and the, uh, so in this case, the delta x is serving the role of the h. It's not really height because we're not going up. It would just be a delta x. But what's the pi r squared? What does that pi r squared tell you about? Specifically, what aspect of the circle? The, I would say specifically the, the area of that face, the area here. And the thing is, this doesn't have to be a circle. You don't have to have a circular cross section. You could have a pipe with a square cross section, or you could have a pipe with some weird squiggly cross section The exact shape doesn't matter. All that really matters is that it has a consistent area throughout. And in, no matter what the shape of the area is, no matter, no matter what the cross-sectional shape is, if you take the cross-sectional area and multiply by the length, the distance in this case, that tells you volume. So volume is area times distance. If we divide both sides of that by time, Volume over time is the definition of current. But if we split up the other side a little differently, area times, what do we call distance over time? That is how far something travels divided by how much time it takes. Yeah, exactly. That's velocity or speed. <clears throat> 
So that means volume over time, if you expand the formula for volume into area times distance, and then regroup the terms a little bit, volume over time works out to the same thing as area times speed. So area times speed isn't the definition of velocity, the def or current, the definition of current is volume over time. But that also happens to equal area times speed. And area times speed is often much more useful because it allows us to make calculations about the change in kinetic energy density. Any other questions on the geometry of that so far? <clears throat> so let's take a look at how that ties into the continuity principle. If we can rewrite every current as area times speed, then current one at this point can be written as area one times speed one, and current two can be written as area two times speed two, which means the only way for the speeds to be different is what? What's the only way this, the speeds could be different here? Yeah, the speeds can only be different if the areas are different. The speeds will only be different if the areas are different, the cross-sectional areas. Which means if you're comparing two locations that are the same cross-sectional area, you know that the kinetic energy density term can be ignored. Maybe it's moving, but it's moving at the same speed at both locations. In fact, even if there are some changes in the middle of the pipe, let's say you've got a pipe that bulges out, but then returns to the original cross-sectional area. If you're comparing, let's say we call this point three, and we call this point four, points three and four have the same cross-sectional area, so that means they have the same speed. So if you're writing out a Bernoulli equation comparing three and four, you would not include a kinetic energy term because they're the same cross-sectional area since all these deltas, delta is just talking about comparing final minus initial, value four minus value three, or the way around as long as you're consistent. Deltas do not care what happens in between. The other side of the equation does care about what happens in between. This is talking about, is there a pump between those two points? Is there current flowing with resistance between those two points? But all the deltas, all it cares about is initial and final values. On the other hand, if you're comparing point three to point five, there's definitely a difference in speed. But comparing three and four, no change in speed at all. Any questions on that so far? So in this case, point one is a small cross-sectional area, point two is a larger cross-sectional area. So which one is gonna have a faster speed? Yeah, smaller area, so a small area times a fast speed can balance out a large area times a slow speed. So large, or I guess in this case, that would be small. Small area times fast speed can balance out large area times a slow speed. So in this case, we should assume that point one has a slow, has a fast speed and point two has a slow speed. Note that that's still talking about speed. That's not talking about current. The difference there, they're both uh, ratios of time or rates with respect to time. But speed is talking about how far something travels as time passes. Uh, current is talking about how much fluid flows as time passes. So points one and two both have the same amount of fluid flowing past per second. But at point one, the fluid is moving a large distance each second. At point two, the fluid is moving a, a shorter distance per second. So that's the big difference here. However, kinetic energy density involves speed. So that actually does play a role in this term. So let's say we're talking about from one to two. From one to two, is the speed increasing or decreasing? Yeah, we've got a decrease in speed. So delta speed squared would be negative. If we're thinking of this as final minus initial, two minus one. But if we've got a negative change in speed squared, what has to be happening to pressure? 
yet. We've got to have a positive change in pressure. We've got to have an increase in pressure. So point two is going to be a slow speed, but a high pressure. Can you explain again why it's a high pressure? Yeah, we know these changes have to add up to zero. That means they have to be equal and opposite. So oh, we, yeah, I got it. Never mind. Thank you. <laughs> increase in pressure. Uh, whereas point one is going to be at low pressure. So that's something to watch for. If the only difference between two points is cross-sectional area, then the wider region is going to be slow speed and high pressure. The narrower region is going to be fast speed and low pressure because it's got a lot of kinetic energy density, but to balance that out, not as much pressure since pressure also counts as an energy density. And you can see this to some extent if you're looking at a lot of real world situations with a, a pipe or a hose or whatever getting narrower. Like for a river, for instance, if you've got a wide river that suddenly gets narrower, what happens to the river in that narrower region? It gets faster. This is where rapids come from. The wide river getting narrower, all that water has to be passing through a much narrower region. So it's got to go faster to keep up. So you're going to have some rapids in that section of the river. Or if it widens out again, it gets much more slow, much more just gradual flow. Still the same total amount of gallons of water per second, but the speed is different because it has to go through a wider or narrower aperture. Uh, same thing with, for instance, let's say you've just got a garden hose and you put your thumb over the end. What's going to happen to the flow at that nozzle if you put your thumb over the end? Yeah, the speed is going to be faster. You're still getting presumably the same of flow rate, the same amount of gallons of water per second. But by pinching it off mostly, but not entirely, you're forcing it to go through a narrower opening. And so that means it's going to be traveling at a faster speed. So you can get this spray of water. But if you try this, as, the, as you put your thumb over it, the pressure is going to be less. You're going to have a lower water pressure corresponding to the faster water speed. Lower pressure in the sense of lower pressure than the, the water just behind it in the wider region of the hose. So narrower aperture means faster speed and also lower pressure. Any questions on that so far? So we've covered difference in height, difference in speed. Let's take a look at a pump and see exactly what that does. And we're going to take a similar approach here. We're, we, we, can take a, we can focus on what the pump does by looking at just the pump and no, no other changes. So let's assume we have a pipe that's horizontal so we don't have to worry about any changes in height, constant cross-sectional area so we don't have to worry about any changes in speed. And let's say we have a pump, which is often drawn in the diagram as just a circle with sort of an asterisk in it. Is this supposed to represent, I think, like a, a shape of a fan? Because one way to design a pump is you just have sort of a fan shape in the, in the pipe spinning around. So pulling on one end and pushing on the other end. That means a pump does have directionality. A pump is pulling on one side and pushing on the other side. So let's say the pump is pushing this way. Usually that'll be shown as an arrow on the diagram, or sometimes it's intended to be clear from other information. But if we're comparing two points here, let's say point one right before the pump and point two right after the pump, what terms in the Bernoulli equation can we ignore? What do we not have to include here? Gravitational potential. Right, there's no change in height, so we can ignore gravitational potential. Also, we're assuming constant cross-sectional area, so what else can we ignore? Right, we can ignore kinetic energy. And I know it's very tempting to think that the pump, to, to think that the pump makes the fluid go faster. And it is true that the fluid with the pump is gonna go faster than the fluid would without the pump. But we're not comparing to what would happen without the pump. We're comparing what's going on at location one and what's going on at location two. And we know that these two points have to have the same speed as each other because they have the same cross-sectional area. We still have the same current going in and out. We've got some current going in 
and some current going out. And because of continuity, current one equals current two. The pump does not cause one side to have more current than the other because the pump is not creating fluid. The pump is just pushing through the fluid that's already there. So current in and current out have to match each other because of continuity principle. So if we do compare points one and two, we know we can ignore kinetic energy density because there's no change in area. We can ignore potential energy density because there's no change in height. What terms do we need to include then? What would our Bernoulli equation look like? Pressure and the pump. Right. Delta pressure is the only thing left on this side because we've gotten rid of everything else. And of course, there's definitely a pump term because there is a pump between points one and two. And there is current flowing. Should we consider this pipe to have resistance? Probably not, yeah. Realistically, every pipe has resistance, but if we assume that points one and two are very close to, to each other, if, they, if this is a very short pipe and let's say also a very wide pipe and very low viscosity fluid, we can probably assume the resistance is small enough to ignore. So our Bernoulli equation in total is just gonna be this, delta pressure equals work density of the pump, which means all that a pump really does is cause a boost in pressure. The pump causes the pressure to change by a constant amount. This work done by the pump density is presumably a constant. So that means all the pump really does is create a difference in pressure from one side to the other. Assuming resistance, uh, probably yes. Or alternatively, if you have enough information to calculate resistance from everything else. Realistically, any pipe is going to have resistance. Uh, if the problem specifically says, assume that there is no resistance or assume no dissipation or assume very smooth walls on the pipe or something, then you can probably ignore resistance. Uh, but realistically, every pipe has some resistance. It's just that in many cases, we might be able to set things up so that the resistance is small enough, we can ignore it. Such as in this case, we're assuming no, uh, essentially no resistance. Uh, we are including current. It's just that the current is being multiplied by resistance and we're assuming resistance is so small it rounds off to zero. Let me actually write that down. Assume negligible resistance. So if we wrote that in, minus IR, but if we assume resistance is so small it rounds off to zero, I times zero is zero. So that means that that term doesn't play a role in the equation. Any other questions on that so far? So what I wanna emphasize here is that all the pump does is provide a boost in pressure. The two sides of the pump will be at different pressures from each other. Specifically, you're gonna have one side that's higher pressure and one side that's lower pressure. Because all the pump is really doing is pushing is pushing on one side, creating a high pressure zone and pulling on the other side, creating a low pressure zone. So that's the delta pressure that this equation is talking about. <clears throat> and if you subtract two minus one, high pressure minus low pressure, you're gonna get a positive value. If you subtract in the other direction, if you subtract low pressure minus high pressure, you'd get a negative. So the work density of the pump could be positive or negative depending on which order it's installed in. Like if you flip the pump, and let's say you turn everything off, uninstall the pump, flip it and reinstall it and turn it back on, then you'd have a negative instead of a positive. But ultimately whether it's negative or positive really just depends on which order you're subtracting in. Are you subtracting two minus one versus one minus two? So typically we just set, set up the subtraction to make sure we get a positive value for work done by the pump. So if you know which way the pump is installed, I would just set things up in the first place so you're subtracting high pressure minus low pressure. And then stay consistent about that order throughout the entire problem. Any questions on that so far? Will the pump ever be lowering pressure or will it always be adding energy? 
it's really just a matter of which order you're looking at it. If you look at from two to one, then you are experiencing a decrease in pressure. But the, the, the thing about the pump is it just creates a difference between a high pressure zone and a low pressure zone. Whether that's treated as an increase or decrease just, to turn, just depends on which one we're calling initial and which one we're calling final. But typically we think of the initial versus final in terms of treating the pump as creating a boost in pressure, an increase in pressure. So I would tend to think of this as this being initial and this being final. And typically that's the direction current's gonna be flowing anyway. Any other questions on that so far? So the pump provides a constant boost in pressure, this constant difference between a low pressure zone on one side and a high pressure zone on the other side. And that constant is often called just epsilon. And we use this for electrical situations also. Uh, in an electrical circuit, what would be providing that constant boost much like a pump is for fluids? Yeah, a battery is the electrical version of a pump. A pump is providing a constant boost in pressure. A battery in an electrical circuit is providing a constant boost in voltage, which is basically the electrical version of pressure. So just like a, a pump provides a difference between a low pressure zone and a high pressure zone on the other side, a battery provides a difference between a low pressure zone, low voltage zone on one side and high voltage zone on the other side. So we'll look into that in more detail when we get to electric circuits. But either way, it's just providing a constant boost to, in the case of fluids, pressure, in the case of electrical stuff, voltage. Uh, but let's take a look at a current or a current flowing through a pipe with resistance as well. So now let's ignore everything except resistance. Let's assume we've got no pump, no change in height, no change in cross-sectional area. We've just got some section of pipe with resistance. In that case, if we're comparing points one and two, And let's assume current is flowing from one to two. If we set up our Bernoulli equation, and we gotta be careful about sign here. Let's say delta is gonna mean two minus one. I find it useful to think of it in terms of final minus initial in terms of the direction current is flowing, wherever current is flowing towards minus wherever current is flowing away from. Uh, what terms would we actually include in the Bernoulli equation here? Yeah, we're definitely going to have the minus IR term. There's no pump, so we can ignore that. Uh, the thing is there might be a pump somewhere else. This might be, this pipe might be connected to more pipes that have a pump somewhere else. But as long as there's no pump in this path from one to two, we can ignore it. Because this side of the equation is talking about stuff between those two points along the path that we're talking about. If there's no pump along that path, then we would ignore it. Even if there might be a pump somewhere else. What about on the left side of the equation? What delta terms do we need to include here? Yeah, we definitely ha could have a delta pressure. Again, because delta pressure is often what can change to balance out other stuff, other changes. We know there's no change in height because this is a horizontal pipe, no change in speed because there's no difference in cross-sectional area. So pressure is the only other thing that can be changing. And this, goes, this ultimately goes back to the idea of science as a controlled experiment. We're setting up a situation where there's only one thing, well, only two things changing, the currents flowing through resistance and change in pressure. So we can control this. We, can, we know that if there's a change in pressure, we know it's because of this term. And this suggests that current flowing through a pipe with resistance causes a change in pressure. That from point one to point two, there is gonna be a difference in pressure Points one and two are at different pressures because there is current flowing through resistance. 
And based on this equation, which one of these would you expect to be higher pressure? Yeah, one is gonna be higher pressure, two is gonna be lower pressure, because what do we know about this delta pressure here? As the resistance increases, the change in pressure will decrease. Uh, the pressure is definitely decreasing, although I would be careful about resistance. I wouldn't say resistance is decreasing here because resistance is not really something you're accumulating. Resistance is just a property of this section of pipe. We would say this section of pipe has a certain resistance and that just stays the same. So there's definitely a decrease in pressure, but note that this term is not a change. This is just a constant value, negative IR. So the change in pressure is because of current flowing through a pipe with resistance. In fact, in, in a lot of ways, this is very similar to like, these are the delta E total terms from a conservation of energy situation. And this is work and heat. We wouldn't really say heat is increasing or heat is decreasing in a conservation of energy situation. We just say heat is entering or heat is leaving. So this minus IR term is equivalent to heat leaving the system. And that heat leaving the system causes a drop in pressure drop in energy density. But we would definitely say that point one is the high pressure, high pressure zone. And point two is the low pressure zone. In other words, current is flowing from the high pressure zone towards the low pressure zone. And there are a couple of ways you could think about this. We, I mean, ultimately this is just that the decrease in pressure is related to the current flow. You could think of this as the flow of current through resistance causes a drop in pressure. Or the other way around, you could think of it as the difference in pressure pushes current through. The difference in pressure is what's causing the fluid to flow. In fact, if you solve this for I, what would you get? pressure over resistance or delta pressure over resistance. And we also have a negative there because we have to divide by the negative. So this is telling us that the current is flowing at a rate proportional to the pressure difference. More difference in pressure means faster current flow. And also inversely proportional to resistance. More resistance means slower current. So if you have a pipe with lots of resistance, you're gonna get a very slow current. Or to put it another way, you'd need more pressure difference to get the same current if you have lots of resistance. And we've also got this negative sign. What do you think this negative sign really represents in this equation? Why do we have a negative sign there in the first place? Yeah, we've got a, a drop in a, a loss of pressure. We're losing pressure specifically if we're going from one to two. But note if we go the other direction, if we're talking about comparing point two to point one, from two to one, there's an increase in pressure. So from one to two, there's a decrease in pressure. From two to one, there's an increase in pressure. Why would going from one to two kind of be the preferable way of thinking about this? What's special about from one to two? What's special about that direction? It is subtracting, uh, it's going from high to low, but specifically that's also the direction of what? Yeah, that's the flow of current itself. So in the direction current is traveling, we get a decrease in pressure. If you're looking at it the other direction, if you ignore the, what's going on inside and just say, let's say we, instead of subtracting two minus one, let's subtract one minus two. If you subtract one minus two, high pressure minus low pressure, would you get a positive or negative result? If you're subtracting a high pressure minus a low pressure, what would you get? High minus low, would you get positive or negative as the result? Yeah, you get positive. So if we're subtracting one minus two, 
one minus two, high pressure minus low pressure. Delta pressure would be a negative, or sorry, a positive, because we're taking high pressure minus low pressure. What does that tell you about this side of the equation? Uh, the right side of the equation. If we have a positive on the left side, this whole thing has to be positive, right? So the current is going to have to be negative so that this negative and this negative become a positive. So the uh, current would have to be treated as negative. And this is kind of weird. We're, you, we're accustomed to thinking of current as just an always positive value. But what do you think positive versus negative would refer to for current? Yeah, exactly. Negative and then a negative value. The negatives cancel out. But why would that be? Why would, uh, what, what do you think positive versus negative would be talking about in, a, uh, in, in terms of current? Yeah, it's really all about direction. Whether we treat current as positive versus negative is all about the direction current is flowing. And typically for simplicity, if you know which direction current is flowing, just call that the positive direction. So if we know current is flowing from left to right, I would just say to the right is the positive direction. And for your delta, I would just subtract two minus one, if you think of that as final minus initial. On the other hand, if you don't already know which direction your current is flowing, you can just make a guess and say, I'm guessing that this is the positive direction. If your guess turns out to be wrong in terms of the direction current's actually flowing, the math all still works. You just get a negative value for current. So current being negative just means current is flowing in the opposite direction to what you're calling positive. And that's fine. The math still works out perfectly. The, the Bernoulli equation still works. But it's usually easier to understand what's going on if you can treat the current as a positive value. So if you have a good idea of which direction current is flowing, I would treat that direction as positive and think of all the deltas as final minus initial in terms of the direction current is flowing. And that's not final and initial in terms of time. We're still not talking about time passing. We're just looking at the whole thing at one instant in time. But it's helpful to think of it in terms of the point that current is flowing towards minus the point that current is flowing away from. Yeah, exactly, position rather than time. Any other questions on that so far? Um, so if I isn't changing and R isn't changing, how is there a change in P? Uh, because this term does not have a delta on it. This is not talking about how much the current is changing or how much the resistance is changing. This is talking about how fast is the current flowing right now and how much resistance is there in the pipe right now. So these terms don't have deltas on them. Okay. Because it's just like, it's hard for me to see how like the pressures are different if like it's the same values for those at both sides of the pipe. It's really that the, all these deltas on the left side of the equation, these are talking about differences from one location to another. Mm -hmm. These are not talking about differences from one location to the other. These are talking about what's happening between the two locations we're comparing. Uh, okay. between, the between the two locations. Is there current flowing between the two locations? Yeah. So those aren't deltas. I mean, this is ultimately the same reason why we, like in the conservation of energy stuff, we wouldn't write a delta on work or heat. Work and heat aren't changing. Work and heat are the processes that cause the other changes to happen. They're not state functions, so you treat them as like processes. That's exactly it. These okay. delta things, these are state functions, whereas these are processes. Got it, thank you. Path dependent. Any other questions on that so far? And again, you could think of this in terms of the difference in pressure is forcing current to flow. And the more different the pressures are, the faster current is going to flow. Or you could think of it as the presence of current causes a difference in pressure. And the faster current is flowing, the more different the pressures are. So either one of those is valid. Those are both valid ways of thinking about pressure and current. The important thing is they're both happening. There is a difference in pressure, and there is a current flowing, and they're proportional to each other. The faster current is flowing, the more difference in pressure there is, and vice versa. And then resistance is just a constant of proportionality associating those two together. More resistance means it takes more delta pressure to get the same current. Or to put it another way, more resistance means the same current will get you a larger difference in pressure. And resistance ultimately depends on properties of the pipe and the fluid together. Uh, for instance, a longer pipe is going to have more resistance. 
a wider pipe is going to have less resistance because the wider the pipe is, the easier it is to flow through. Whereas the longer it is, the more opportunities there are to lose energy. Uh, and also the, the fluid itself makes a difference. A, a very high viscosity fluid like syrup or crude oil is going to have a very high resistivity. A very low viscosity fluid like water or alcohol is going to have lower resistance. So resistance, in fact, you could even, I don't, want to, I don't really want to write out a formula here because I don't remember exactly what it is. It always turns out to be more complicated than I think I remember it. But it depends on length of the pipe, more length means more resistance, cross-sectional area of the pipe, more area means less resistance, and also the fluid, the, the viscosity of the fluid. Uh, the material of the pipe, not as much. I used to think it did, but I actually looked it up a couple of years ago and it turns out that it's more, it's really more about the material of the fluid. I think the texture of the pipe can make a difference. Like if the interior of the pipe is really smooth versus really rough. Uh, more area of contact. It turns out that the, the, the cross-sectional area, it's really more about how much of the fluid is in contact with that surface. So if you expand the cross-sectional area, there or the, the cross-sectional area, there is more surface that's able to be in contact, but there's also a lot more interior. If you're looking at a very narrow pipe, most of the fluid is in contact with the walls. If you're looking at a much wider pipe, most of the fluid is in the middle and not in contact with the walls. Yeah, exactly. On average, most of the fluid is not being influenced by the walls as much. Whereas for a narrow pipe, most of the fluid is being influenced by the walls very strongly. So you could think of that as like on average how far the, the any given chunk of fluid is away from the walls. Very wide pipe and the fluid the walls are hardly influencing the middle at all. The middle can go very fast because it's not near the walls. The edges are moving more slowly because they're being held back by the walls. And that, that idea that the edges are moving more slowly and the interior is moving more quickly is typically called laminar flow. Uh, laminar flow. And that's the type of flow we're assuming everything's going at here. If the fluid goes really fast, then the stuff near the wall sort of kicks back on itself and, and causes more interference with the water going in the middle and that's called turbulent flow. Uh, but laminar flow is what we're assuming everything's doing here. Any other questions on that? So it looks like we've covered all the individual parts of the Bernoulli equation. I think you now have all the pieces to the puzzle. The tricky part now is going to be putting all those together. So using all these pieces, see if you can run through the FNT problems. And if you're dealing with some large complicated situation, try splitting it up into individual pieces. Like if you've got a flow pipe and a bunch of standpipes, try looking at just the flow pipe or try looking at just one standpipe and split it up into individual pieces of fluid systems that match these simpler cases we've just looked at. So give that a try and see if you can put it all together and feel free to contact me online if you have any other questions or if you want to request any examples for next time. See you then.